Today, we are talking about number five on the top 25 most interesting fantasy basketball players, and it is my guy, Evan Mobley. And on today's pod, we're going to talk about why I am so high on the big fella. Let's go! Jordan, open! Chicago with the lead! We talking about practice. LeBron James with no record for human life. And he's going to go. Back out to Allen. His three-pointer. Bang! Curry for three. Wow! Unbelievable. Making it rain in New York. We the North are now we the champions. Not the destination. It's the journey. Mamba out. G'day and welcome again to the Ball Boys Fantasy Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Mitch Casey, and you can find me on Twitter at Ball Boys Fantasy. And today we are talking about one of my favorite players for this season in fantasy basketball, and that is Evan Mobley. Uh, I have talked about him probably more than any other player in fantasy hoops so far this preseason, and he is very well established as a bit of a my guy this season. And he comes in to me at number five in the most fascinating and most interesting fantasy basketball players this season. We're going to uncover why I think he's going to have a breakout season and why I think he is underrated in a lot of circles. And uh, yeah, the rationale behind all of that. And uh, that's going to be what we're talking about today. So before we get into it though, guys, if you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button on YouTube. We are getting so close to 10K subscribers. Would love if you haven't already, go hit that subscribe button. And uh, I promise you will get in return lots and lots of fantasy content. And also, if you're looking for that extra bit of help for your fantasy draft coming up this weekend, go over to ballboysmba.com and get yourself my season guide where you will get access to my top 250 projections for points leagues, both Yahoo and ESPN. ESPN points, um, my rankings for both those things, top 150. Uh, you'll get my nine cat rankings, my eight cat rankings, my minus one rankings, as well as my top 250 dynasty rankings and lots of other fantasy goodies over there. So go and check that one out at ballboysmba.com. Let's get stuck in. Evan Mobley, he is very, very good. He is still only 22 years of age. He played 79 games last season, so quite durable. Obviously, he's going to his third year in the NBA. So we uh, we can call it a third-year breakout. Uh, on Yahoo, he's going at an average of 42.2 as his a- average draft position. ESPN are falling asleep at the wheel and how drafting him at 57.4. Fan tracks at 39.3. So roughly around that 40s mark. So in the fourth round is where he goes a lot of the time. Last year, like we said, 79 games uh, played. So only missed the three games for the entire season. Played 34.4 minutes. He ranked 53rd in nine category 50th in minus one and 47th for Yahoo points league. So again, you guys over at ESPN, I don't know what you guys are doing over there, but you're drafting him behind where he went last season. He's a third year player. Um, You would expect those guys to get better each year. And yeah, I don't know why you expect him to be worse this season than he was last season. So when you're drafting him around the 40s, that is making, uh, expecting him to take a step forward, but I think he's going to take an even bigger step forward than what we are giving him credit for. So today, what we're going to talk about is just that. The main things that I'm going to be focusing on in terms of why I think he's going to be a better player, there's two main reasons. The first of which is that from his rookie season to his second season, he took the exact amount, same amount of shot attempts uh, in both those years. He took exactly 12 shot attempts per game. His field goal attempts were 12 per game in both seasons. Now, I would expect that in his third season, Evan Mobley takes a step forward and gains more usage than he did in his rookie season. Last season, there was the addition of Donovan Mitchell. So he kind of made way for that and allowed himself to sort of you know, just kind of do the same thing. He's been contributing to a winning team ever since he's basically put on a Cavs uniform. And so he hasn't had the luxury of a lot of other rookies in terms of, um, you know, getting force-fed shot attempts because he's a young player. He's kind of had to have done it through the system in a winning basketball team. But I think now that in his third NBA season where we see a lot of players really break out he has the opportunity to step forward as well, like he already has on the defensive end of the court, on the offensive side of the court as well. So 
he is someone that I expect to take a step forward. Like I said, 12 shot attempts per game in his first two seasons. His free throw attempts were the exact same as well, 3.7 to 3.8. So the improvement he saw was literally only in getting just more efficient um, per game. And I think that now we're going to see him take a step forward. Like you, you can't tell me that Evan Mobley is going to be taking the same amount of shot attempts for the third year in a row as he was as his rookie season. Like, that just doesn't make sense. I don't really care where it comes from. I think it just has to come from somewhere. He is the future of this franchise. Um, So I think one way or another, he's going to get more shot attempts. So that's the first big thing for me. The second big thing for me is the fact that I believe that he's going to be playing more minutes at center and that we see Jarrett Allen move down in minutes, move Mobley over to playing more center minutes. And I think that that can only help his value in seeing more rebounds, more blocks, better field goal percentage, and probably more scoring as well. So we're going to talk all about that today. Let's start by looking at his stats and what he averaged last season. So in his uh, second year in the NBA, put up 16.2 points, 0.03s, 9 rebounds, 2.8 assists, 0.8 steals, 1.5 blocks, 55.4% from the field, and shot 67.4% from the free throw line. So like we said, those numbers were good for basically top 50 numbers last year. Um, And... Like we said, there was no in- increase in usage, no increase in uh, shot attempts. It was all just him improving in field goal percentage, basically going up. Uh, what did he do his rookie season? He put up 52%. So he's gone up uh, about 3.5% there. So really, not too much of a j- jump forward, but he did take a-, a small improvement. Again, rebounds were a little bit more, assists were a little bit higher in his second year compared to his first year. So we really just seen him do this, you know, really solid level so far in at least his stat profile in his first couple of seasons. But if we look at the other, the stats on the board here, now I haven't included the percentages because it was too much work for me to go through every single game and average it all out. But in in games without uh, Jarrett Allen there, he put up 16.9 points per game. So an extra 0.7 points per game. 10.5 rebounds per game, an extra one and a half rebounds. He averaged more assists, 3.2. 0.7 steals was the same. And two blocks per game when Jarrett Allen was not playing and when um, Mobley was playing center. So we can see an extra one and a half rebounds, an extra half a block. Um, again, I didn't do the field goal percentage, but we often see that field goal percentage also rises when you play more at center com- um, compared to playing at power forward. And I believe that Jarrett Allen is going to be playing less minutes at center and we'll get into that reason why in a second. So if I combine those two things and we increase him from going 12 shots a game to... I think it's not unreasonable to expect him to get closer to 14, 14 and a half shots per game, which can give him enough of an average to get him closer to sort of that 19, 20 points per game mark. You combine with the fact that he's an excellent passer, an underrated passer, and they've talked about using him more as a playmaker on this team. So I think he can comfortably get to three and a half assists per game, three to three and a half assists per game. He gets you close to a steal as a center, which is pretty solid. The free throw percentage is something that we need to be aware of, and it's not something that I think is going to dramatically improve, but I think he can be someone that averages more like a 70% as opposed to like 67%, which is what he did last season because he's, he's got a nice stroke. He is someone that, um, you know, we've seen in patches shoot well from the perimeter, and I don't really see a reason why he can't continue to just slowly get better at that as he get more, gets more comfortable in the NBA and a little bit more experience. So I think that can make me just take a small little step forward, and it is quite a volatile stat year to year. So, um, But the big thing here is that big increase in rebounds, the big increase in his block shots, and I think the usage along with that sees him rise. Again, he was top 50 in minus one rankings last, last year. I have him projected around like a top 30, top 25 uh, range. So going up a couple of rounds in value is where I expect him to go. So let's talk about uh, Jarrett Allen. So Jarrett Allen, his minutes last year, I, again, when I started doing all this research, I was shocked to learn that he averaged 32.6 minutes per game, which if you actually look at a lot of the centers that put up those types of minutes, it is very rare. There were only six centers in the NBA that averaged more minutes than Jarrett Allen did last season. And they were Nikola Jokic, Joel Embiid, Bam Adebayo, DeMontis Sabonis, Anthony Davis, and Nikola Vucevic. At least five of those players are the 
basically the creme de la creme of the center position, the best of the best. And then you've got Nikola Vucevic, who, again, he, he plays a decent amount of minutes. I think they actually were very, very close in minutes. So when you look at Jarrett Allen and you compare him to those other centers, you don't necessarily associate with him as this guy that needs to get 33, 32 minutes per night. To me, especially after what we saw in the playoffs with also some of the acquisitions that they made in the offseason, Jarrett Allen profiles to me more as a guy who's going to see minutes in the high 20s rather than the low 30s. And you may not think that that is a whole lot, but it is enough to swing a fair bit of value Mobley's way um, and get more of those, those minutes on the floor where he is running as the five and you're going to get better value, more shooting around the rest of them. And you're going to see players, uh, or, or sorry, someone like Mobley uh, capitalize that with blocks, rebounds, and field goal percentage increased. So again, if we look at some other starting centers in the NBA that I think you can profile uh, Jarrett Allen closer to. So look at these numbers for some of these centers. DeAndre Ayton averaged 30.4. Wendell Carter Jr. averaged 29.6. Miles Turner averaged 29.4. Steven Adams averaged 27. Nurkic, 26.8. Clint Capella, 26.6. Jakob Pertl, 26.5. If I told you that Jakob Pertl should play more minutes than Jarrett Allen. I don't think you should turn your nose up on that. I actually personally think that Jakob Pertl is a better player than Jarrett Allen. Now, Jarrett Allen is solid, okay? And I do think that Pertl should play more minutes than that. So if they met somewhere in the middle, more around that 28 minute per night mark, I think personally that's more where Jarrett Allen should be playing. And I think that based on the results of what we saw in the playoffs, and the team needing to switch something up, I believe that that is a very realistic thing that we can see this season. So I do believe that Jarrett Allen's minutes can come down as far as 28 per game instead of the 32 and a half. And if you take off four and a half minutes per game off a player, you're going to see their production drop, which is why he was in my top 10 bust list. But you are also going to see that those minutes allocated. Now, I don't think it's necessarily going to boost Allen's minutes per se. I mean, he was at 34. Uh, I project him to be at 35 this season. But it's the minutes played at center and the fact that you're not going to be next to another guy who is a really good rebounder, who is a really uh, you know close to the rim finisher, a shot blocker. Allen is going to be off the court a bit more so that Mobley can get a few of those, um, you know, a few of the benefits of that. So I think it's very reasonable to say that someone like a uh, Miles Turner should play probably more minutes than a Jarrett Allen. Someone like a DeAndre Ayton should probably play more minutes than than a Jarrett Allen. Uh, even someone like Wendell Carter Jr., I think underrated can space the floor for the, the Orlando Magic. If you look at these guys, these guys should be playing more minutes than him. And... Um, not to say that the Cavs look at this and decide, okay, he should be here, but it just, it just to me makes it more, it makes more sense to see, okay, well, why is he playing 32 and a half minutes per night? And is that something that the Cavs are going to make sure continues? No, I don't think so. It's very, it's not uncommon to see starting centers in the NBA play closer to 25, 26, 27, 28 minutes per night. That is not uncommon. And in fact, like I showed, showed on the previous slide, only five or six players playing more minutes to him is more uncommon. So I think it's more likely we see those numbers come down from Jarrett Allen. So again, when we go back to what we saw from Evan Moby playing as a center without uh, Allen there, and remember, Allen is injured at the moment. So he is going into the season with an injury. So you might even see the minutes ramp up slowly. Bone bruises are sometimes things that can take a while to heal and need to be managed even when coming back. So you could really see Evan Mobley start off the season with uh, like a house on fire. And a lot of the time when you have a young, up-and-coming, superstar center type player, get that sniff of like, I'm the guy here, this is my team, I'm the center. That lends itself to the team continue to build around that. And I think that this opportunity is not going to be one that Evan Mobley lets slip. So... There's a lot, I suppose there's a lot of gut feel here. He's the, he was the third All-NBA um, you know, player last year in his second year. I've said before, it's the second youngest player to do it since Kobe Bryant. You just need to keep this man happy. You need to keep this man out on the floor. He does the best job as a center as well, in my opinion. You need more shooting. They've played players like Karis LeVert, George Niang, uh, Max Struess out there on the court next to some of these players. And I think that's more of the lineups we're going to see for the Cavs. And again, if I just look at my projections here, 
Um, 19.8 points per game, 9.7 rebounds, 3.3 assists, 0.9 steals, 1.8 blocks on, um, what's that, 56% from the field with 69% from the free throw line. That all seems very realistic to me. And again, I don't go in and rank players. I go in and I put the projections and an algorithm will spit out where they finish to me. So in my rankings, in my well, so the projections, they rank him at... Where is he? He's ranked at 26th in minus one. He's 28th in nine cat, 38th in eight cat. So if you were at a, an eight cat roto league, you might value him a little bit less because again, there's less punting going on. He does get a slight boost because again, he's a center that doesn't turn the ball over as much as a lot of those guards. But again, when you are able to punt the free throws or punt the threes, or if you can deal with his percentages a little bit better, he is someone that I think is very valuable. He also gives you that rare opportunity to get someone who maybe averages closer to 20 points, gives you uh, three assists and a steal per game, puts you up 1.7, 1.8 blocks. And that luxury allows you to avoid drafting players like a Walker Kessler, like a um, Claxton, who's probably not as good of an example, but Walker Kess is the big example of someone who is so good in so few areas, but really bad in a lot of other areas as well. So it allows you to avoid a player like that and then pick up some of the later guys like a Durin or a Mark Williams or a Gafford or a Zach Collins and that be enough for you to get by and you're still really quite strong in those points, assists, steals with the other guards and wings and stuff you draft early. So to me, that stat combination is also very valuable in that situation. We talk about, you know, um, not only the rankings that a player gives you, but also what what they actually do and how that can actually help your team in terms of, you know, categorical scarcity. A player who puts up 20, 10, two blocks, three assists, a steal, does it efficiently from the field. It's very hard to come by. There's not many players that actually do that. And Evan Mobley has to do has the ability to do that and potentially even more if Allen misses some time with this injury. So that's a, that's, a, that's a big old spiel as to why he is one of my favorite players to draft this season. I am a big believer in his talent. I think, again, this is all just me projecting him to just do more and play in the center. Even if he just takes another talent leap and just takes a breakout step in his third season, we could see an even better player come into the fantasy basketball space this season. So I'm a big fan of Jared. uh, Sorry, not Jared Allen. I'm a big fan of Evan Mobley. And I think that he is someone that you could easily consider in your third round. Probably don't have to reach that far, but definitely in your fourth round, he is someone I would be targeting if you're looking for those players that can give you blocks and rebounds and some assists as well from the center position. We are inside our top four players left. There are four players to go. On this list, we have two players who are the number one pick in fantasy basketball. Tomorrow, we are going to be talking about one of them. Let me know down in the comments section, who do you think is going to be number four on the fantasy basketball and most interesting? If you have been enjoying this series, guys, really would appreciate if you give this video a big thumbs up, drop all your questions down in the comments, and I'll see you guys tomorrow where we'll talk about number four.